start with a very important note. I don't like quotas either. But who would? Quotas are a very clear admission of guilt that our system and processes haven't worked. But the truth is that they haven't. To make an easier analogy, I don't know many people who love the idea of driving or speeding fines, and I don't know anybody that would like to bet their road security on the idea that there are fines in place. No. We educate, we teach kids, we require an exam, we put adverts on TV about the importance of never drinking and driving, and we really hope that the majority of the results come from prevention and education. But because that is not enough, and because it is a subject that really matters, we implement other measures punitive measures to persuade even more and make sure we stay on the right path. Quotas are not dissimilar, they are not instead of. In fact, they work much better when they go along with other measures, but as the speed changes are happening, it is time to take that extra step. I think to make my case, I need to start with a two minutes explanation of, of the often unseen but very real and conscious bias that women suffer in the workplace. Feel free to ask me for the links of the studies after. There are four kinds of unconscious bias. One, performance bias. Women's performance tend to be underrated. That is why this year, when one of the most elite universities in France couldn't conduct the oral exam due to COVID-19 and had to rely on the anonymous written one, their admission of women rose to 80%, doubling the average 40% of the previous years. Women are on average 30% less likely to be called for a job interview than a man with the same characteristics. Second, attribution bias. Women are less credited for success, but blame more for failure, even when they are working in mixed couples. Men interrupt women up to three times more than men. But not only that, women also interrupt other women much more than they would interrupt a man. No wonder women's confidence take a hit, which is clearly obvious in the fact that men generally apply for a job when meeting 60% of the criteria, while women tend to wait until they tick all the boxes. Third, likability bias. In the famous study case made in Columbia University, two identical CVs were given to students, one under the name of Heidi and the other under Howard. The students rated Heidi and Howard as a quality component. However, Howard was judged to be likable and a good colleague. Heidi instead was seen as aggressive, selfish, and just not someone who would be a team player, someone they'd less like to work with. Fourth, affinity bias. We gravitate towards people that are like us, that look like us. Because of that, mentoring and sponsorships tend to happen between the same gender and the same race. And because white men hold more powerful positions, the structure is not very welcome to organic change. Those are the four core biases, but we should also mention maternal bias, which affect even women that don't have or want kids. And of course, how race, disability and other biases all multiply each other in the form of double discriminations and intersectionality. This is important because before we accuse quotas of not being meritocratic, we need to clarify that neither is the current system. It is inherently flawed. Quotas are not about erasing men's merits. Instead, actually, they're not about men <laughs> at all. They're all about removing obstacles and leveling the play field for women. This is not about what men will have less access to. It is about what women will have more access to. I have met a total of um, zero men that accredit any amount of their success or position to their gender. When a man gets a job, it's never because he's a man. But when it's a woman, we question the why. It's not only the quotas and it's definitely not new. Who has she slept with? I wonder who is her father. She must be our diversity hire. The fact that we give more value to gender than to capacity only in women's reinforce instead of diminish the need of quotas. Maybe once the representation is being so small, we will stop picking up on them as individuals defined by gender. One of the big concerns about quotas is indeed tokenism. And to be honest, it's not something I'm really worried about personally. So if anybody is specifically looking for a young woman to bring diversity to their non-executive board, then please contact me. But anyway, I do know that there are women saying that they would hate to be chosen for a job because of their gender. But I happen to know even more women who are tired of not getting the job at all because of the same reason. Women who are legitimately complaining about gender discrimination. Women tired of not seeing others like them at the top to be role models and inspirations. And women complaining about glass ceilings. And we have the data and the research to back it all up. 
the most diverse companies are already ahead of the game. The companies that value diverse talent are already implementing proactive measures. Women in those companies feel valued and respected for their merits, but, and this is important, also for being women, with no shame in that, no tokenism. The other companies, the one in which women feel tokenized or delegitimized, are the ones that most desperately need the quotas. The same way that the speeding fines only penalize those who can be convinced by common sense, education and prevention. Once the number of women board members in those companies raises towards the 40% target proposed by the European Union, the group will achieve a strength that makes more difficult to undermine their voices, and if recruited properly, it will be very difficult not to see their talent. At 40% representation, a group is no longer marginalized. Simply having enough women is the solution for the potential negative stigma. While I did only one or two is what leads to tokenization. And because those quotas would mean that you would have to listen to them, people will get out of their way to find the right ones, instead of complaining that it's just about married and women are just falling short. If you had to have those numbers, 40%, you would just make sure that you hired competent ones, the same way you do with men. And the same as with men, you might not always get it right. If it doesn't work, well, fire and rehire. And if it still doesn't work, then ask yourself why. Are you hiring the correct ones? Are you looking for them in the right places? Is your business attracting that talent? Basically, treat them the same that you would do with the white men, or also known as the human neutral. Young women's participation at higher education level has now reached almost 57%, compared to only 40% for young men, and women are getting consistently better grades all through school and university. You would expect a pool pretty full of good candidates, or at least as good as their masculine counterpart. I really, really refuse to believe that there are not enough talented Italian women that want a well-paid non-executive job. Are we claiming that there's no talent or no interest? Are we claiming that men are so superior to women that there's no problem whatsoever in finding them, but it's so scarce when it's for women? What research has shown is that people have prototypes about their ideal worker or their ideal leader, which is typically male. We need to expand that idea of an ideal candidate beyond the male prototype and create a larger vision, a more diverse one. Because women are higher more on past achievement, while men are higher on future potential, without prior experience in boardrooms, it is simply even more difficult for women to compete, as their potential doesn't seem to be taken into account. We need mechanisms in place to redress this imbalance. And if you're looking for good reasons as what we need to shift the balance in the boardroom, well, there's plenty of proof. In the independent report by Deloitte about women in the boardroom, they affirm that the studies have repeatedly shown that increasing diversity is not only the right thing to do for an organization's culture, but it also leads to better business outcomes. Increased diversity leads to smarter decisions making, contributes to an organization's bottom line, and powers innovation, among other benefits. It has also been proven that there is a direct correlation between more women board members and a stronger environmental and philanthropic performance. So we all win. This, there is often argued that there's a financial performance improvement as well, but even putting the money argument aside, I don't think there's any doubt that more diversity leads to better informed decision. In fact, in interviews of board members in the US and Europe, it appears that there is hostility towards quotas in countries that don't have them, but actually a strong enthusiasm for quotas in countries that do have them. In other words, only those who were unfamiliar with quotas thought they were a bad thing. Indeed, when examining the lived experience of board members in Norway, there was a strong narrative of change. While director, directors had initially strongly opposed quotas, one they were imposed by the government, they changed their mind. According to them, their fears were unfounded, and after a period of transition, they felt that the increased representation of women actually improved overall governance and decision-making. So to sum it up, unconscious bias in the workplace is proven and is extremely damaging for women's career, which affect the diversity in boardrooms, which is proven to be very beneficial for the whole society. We know all this. And we know that because the bias are unconscious, they're very difficult to correct naturally. Quotas are an important part of the solution, but we are stuck with a better the devil you know attitude. I believe that we're ready to move on.
I believe that we're ready to admit that what's in place is not good enough and decide collectively that this is important, that it matters enough to go that extra step, even if it seems difficult to implement, even if it costs discomfort, or maybe precisely because it causes it. If we trusted women and their capacity, we wouldn't be as scared of having to hire more of them, of having to listen to more of them in the boards. I too want quotas to be redundant. I want them to come and then go and to be part of a much broader toolkit starting from kids education and moving forward in every aspect of life. But when we live in a society in which there are more CEOs in the FTSE 350 called Peter than there are women, we can't ignore the fact that something just doesn't add up. We can't keep claiming that the progress will just naturally come. We can't afford leaving 51% of the population behind and keep calling them a minority. Let's regulate quotas, let's implement them properly, let's educate ourselves and let's join those countries that maybe didn't want them but once they've done it are grateful for them. Not because it is a magic wand that will cure sexes, but because it will add more diverse voices into the table where the decisions are being taken and I generally believe that one conversation at a time, that is how we will change the world.